This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Now that vaccine distribution is underway, I'm making a list of things to do post inoculation, including things I don't like, like messy pub crawls, cramming into elevators, and unsolicited hugs. Here's what we got for y'all. Cyber attacks on our nation's health systems have affected hospital patients and clinical trials for COVID vaccines. We talked to staff at one hospital that was hit by cyber criminals. Plus, vaccine hoarding by wealthier nations is leaving poorer nations behind during this pandemic, meaning broader impacts for the rest of the globe. But first, here's what you need to know right now. President-elect Joe Biden will reportedly tap former Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg to head up the Department of Transportation. It's a big promotion for the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, going from overseeing a transportation system of 60 buses to the scope of the nation's airspace and highways. By the way, that isn't a drag, just a big step up. Biden has said his big priorities on transportation will include making much needed repairs to our nation's roads and bridges and pushing for climate-friendly infrastructure, something Buttigieg Judge made central to his own campaign for president. With this pick, Buttigieg will become the first openly gay person to serve as cabinet secretary. Well, it only took six weeks, but Joe Biden had finally got recognition for his election win from some Republican holdouts on Capitol Hill. For the first time, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell acknowledged Biden as the next president, but I wouldn't say he was too excited about it. The Electoral College has spoken. Our country has officially a president-elect and a vice president-elect. Many millions of us had hoped the presidential election would yield a different result. This marks a turning point for several Republicans who had previously defended some of the president's claims and efforts to overturn the vote. After the Electoral College results were ratified, Biden made a speech Monday night with the central message of moving on. The integrity of our elections remains intact. And now it's time to turn the page as we've done throughout our history. More healthcare workers across the US are receiving the first dose of a COVID vaccine as more shipments of the shot from Pfizer and BioNTech arrived at hospitals. Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine is set to be the next one approved for emergency use. Newly released data found it to be highly protective. An advisory panel from the Food and Drug Administration plans to meet Thursday to discuss the findings, with approval coming as soon as the next day. While the approvals are exciting, health experts say it's not time to put your guard down. This week, the U.S. recorded more than 300,000 coronavirus deaths. We do still have a lot of work to do, despite the scientific advances of a vaccine, despite the fact that we're capable from public health measures to do a lot. We still have a long way to go to get everybody on board to pull together. There's a big spotlight on big tech right now as governments around the world look for ways to end anti-competitive behavior. Today, the executive arm of the European Union announced two new pieces of legislation that will force some tech companies to change the way they operate or face hefty fines. Some of the biggest proposed changes would be ending self-preferencing on a search engine and allowing users to uninstall apps that originally came with the device. This year in the US, we've also seen antitrust lawsuits against Google and Facebook. China, Australia, India, and Brazil are some other countries considering new regulations to better get a grip on the billion dollar companies. Our nation's health systems have been under attack from Russian cyber criminals this year, a year when hospitals and medical centers are already straining to meet the demands caused by the pandemic. The cyber attacks have affected hospital access to patient records and shut down clinical trials for the coronavirus vaccine for ransom. Newsy Sasha Ingber has more. A Baltimore hospital is the latest health care provider to fall victim to cyber attacks in the pandemic. The biggest trend you're watching is ransomware is just exploding. Admiral Mike Rogers, the former head of the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command, says the tactics haven't changed. Hackers still mainly use phishing emails to enter systems and hold data hostage until they get paid. But something has changed. Particularly hospitals associated with caring for COVID-19 patients. They cannot afford to shut down. They cannot afford disruption. And when faced with that, they might have a higher probability of saying, look, we have got to stay online, pay the ransom. 
The Greater Baltimore Medical Center is one of the largest community hospitals in the Mid-Atlantic. Their phones were down when Newsy called them days after the attack, with staff declining by email interview requests. A spokesperson later said he couldn't give an exact timetable for when their systems would be restored, but that it wouldn't be in a day or two. I think there's a special place in hell for people who hack hospitals. First you panic, and then you get busy. Sky Lakes, a hospital in an isolated part of Oregon, describes an attack in October. It slowed down COVID testing, but that was the least of it. The procedures that are most heartbreaking are patients who were receiving radiation treatment for cancer because that's all computer controlled and the computers were off. They had to be rescheduled at a facility a mountain range or more away. Around that time, the Department of Homeland Security issued an alert warning health providers of increased cybercrime. And the first known ransomware-related death occurred after an afflicted hospital in Germany had to turn away a woman needing urgent care. It took several days for us to get back into some semblance of normal. Still, some systems are slow to come back. So gradually plowing ahead and getting through what it is we have to do. Cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike attributed the malware used on Skylake's medical center to a Russia-based criminal group called Wizard Spider. The Oregon hospital decided not to pay the ransom, instead choosing to replace more than 2,000 computers and nearly 600 servers. According to software company MZSoft, about a third of hacked companies pay extortion demands. And the rate for prosecuting cybercrime is staggeringly low, estimated at under half a percent. People are more inclined right now in this time of uncertainty to open attachments, for example, open images associated with COVID-19 because we're all trying to figure it out. Hackers, criminals, nation states, they all see those trends and they're all trying to take advantage of it. Experts say the threat comes down to human vulnerability. At Sky Lakes, employees now have more digital safeguards, and some still resort to old-fashioned paper. From Washington, Sasha Ingber, Newsy. We're calling a quick timeout. We'll be ready to play ball when you're back. We try to keep things light during this section and we'll get to that, but when some of the more serious stuff demands our attention, we can't shy away from it. Here's what's trending. Boko Haram is trending after a man claiming to be the leader of the terror group released a recording taking responsibility for the kidnapping of more than 300 students from an all boys school in Northwestern Nigeria. Gunmen took the boys from the government science school on Friday. Thankfully, some managed to escape, but about 320 students are still missing. The group's alleged leader didn't offer evidence for his claim, but this is eerily similar to something the extremist group has done before. Back in 2014, Boko Haram kidnapped more than 200 girls from a town in northeastern Nigeria. In the last six years, half the girls have been found or freed. The fate of the rest of the girls is still unknown. The group has been active in northeast Nigeria since 2009, but this is the first time it's claimed an attack in the northwestern part of the country, showing their reach may be shifting. Turns out the difference between being a businessman and a business man means when you want to step into the world of book publishing, you go big. The entertainment company Rock Nation, founded more than a decade ago by Jay-Z, just announced a partnership with the publisher Random House for a publishing line called Rocklet 101. Plans for upcoming books include a memoir from retired pitcher CeCe Sabathia, a story of black women in music from journalist Danielle Smith, and a book from Meek Mill on criminal justice and survival. No word yet on whether Jay-Z or better yet, Beyonce will add any books to that list, but hey, good news for Blue Ivy. Apparently the line will include children's books. Few halftime performances have captured the hearts and minds like SpongeBob's showing at the Bubble Bowl. J-Lo, who? Shakira, who? Just messing, don't at me. SpongeBob will be taking his talents to the NFL's January 10th wildcard game. Not sure if he's performing, but one can dream. The wildcard game will be broadcasted on Nickelodeon, and much like the usual game, there will be play-by-play -play commentary. 
Unlike the usual game, there will be animated graphics, slime, and of course, SpongeBob, who will be the focus of a pre-show countdown and halftime sneak peek into a new series. Nickelodeon's parent company, Viacom CBS, wants a chance at securing a new rights package for broadcasting NFL games. And one of the NFL's big requests is help bringing in new audiences to the sport. But don't worry, if you want to watch the game minus the slime and animated sea creatures, it will be broadcast traditionally on CBS for all the non-fun adults who lack imagination. Coronavirus vaccines are being delivered to medical centers across the country, which is a pretty good reason to celebrate. But while the US and other countries like the UK have pre-ordered enough vaccine doses to inoculate their populations multiple times over, poorer nations are losing out on the limited vaccine supply. Newsy's Ben Shimizo explains how this vaccine hoarding could affect the rest of the globe. For people in the US, the UK and other wealthy nations, getting vaccinated against COVID-19 seems to be just around the corner. But for billions around the globe, vaccination likely won't happen until 2022, if not later. Rich nations are hoarding the supply by going into these advanced purchase agreements. As a flurry of vaccine candidates move through clinical trials and approval processes, the US and other rich nations have already purchased enough doses to inoculate their populations multiple times over. They're trying to hedge their bets in case some vaccines prove unsuccessful. But this leaves poorer countries with a smaller slice of the vaccine supply. Health experts say that's not just inequitable, it's also self-defeating. It really makes no sense for a rich country to only worry about itself. That rich country can never, ever hermetically seal itself off from the rest of the world. In 67 developing or poor countries, most of them in Africa, only 10% of the population is set to get vaccinated next year, according to a new analysis by Amnesty International and other groups. It's very important to make sure that those populations across the world are vaccinated and we're not focusing on vac vaccinating entire populations of only a few, you know, a handful of countries. Unlike richer countries that are making bilateral deals with vaccine companies, these 67 nations rely entirely on a globally funded initiative to buy and distribute vaccines equitably. The project, known as COVAX, has only secured 700 million vaccine doses so far to be shared among 3.6 billion citizens in 92 countries. But supply should increase over time. It is still likely to take perhaps into 2022 or 2023 before we can envisage global vaccine herd immunity and a true end to this pandemic. Experts and advocates are calling on wealthy governments and pharmaceutical companies to do their part to ensure we reach that milestone as soon as possible. You could see the knowledge being shared, the intellectual property being shared, additional doses being shared. You could see that this could be done in a way that could have international benefits. Ben Shamiso, Newsy. An FBI system update could potentially harm how the agency collects data on crime. For decades, the FBI has been trying to get more than 16,000 law enforcement agencies to change how they collect and report crime data. But there's an issue. In October, we reported on how, because of that change, the FBI would stop collecting information from one in four police agencies, which could affect the ability to observe and analyze changes in crime. The system is only as good as the overall participation from agencies. Newsy's Mark Fahey tells us how law enforcement leaders and criminologists are now speaking out. One man is behind bars and an officer is in the hospital tonight. In Middletown, Ohio, a routine traffic stop turns violent as a driver steps out of a van and lands blow after blow on an officer. In New York City, a policeman is hit in the head with a fire extinguisher. Attacks on my police officers, your police officers, our police officers must stop. But now top law enforcement and criminology groups are worried about losing track of assaults on police and other crimes like murder and rape, following what a Newsy investigation this October revealed. 
an FBI plan to overhaul crime reporting in the U.S. will, for an unknown period of time, end up blocking an estimated quarter of the nation's police agencies from continuing to report incidents to America's premier crime database, the Uniform Crime Report. Yeah, I find that very troublesome. We want a clear, discernible picture of crime going on across this country, especially when it comes to attacks on law enforcement officers. Mike Lewis is the sheriff of Wicomico County, Maryland, two hours east of Baltimore. We are excited about the actual transition, but that is concerning because we're going to lose a lot of information. The time to move to NIBRS is today. The FBI's new crime reporting system, NIBRS, is widely praised for providing more transparency, but thousands of the nation's police agencies won't make the FBI's January deadline, including police in Phoenix and San Francisco. Newsy learned the FBI is moving ahead with a plan to stop collecting crime data from those agencies until they decide to come online. The National Sheriff's Association says after our story, it reached out directly to the FBI with its concerns, telling us that we're a bit troubled to say the least that this would be turned off, because knowing how police interact with citizens leads to better outcomes, better crime prevention. Also worried? The American Society of Criminology, which sent this letter to the FBI, says that its membership is becoming increasingly concerned and is offering to help the FBI spot the most critical crime data to protect before it disappears in the transition. And users need to be incorporated more into the UCR process. Some of the fixes are gonna require remediation. To address the data gap, the FBI said previously it would launch national estimates for crime to stand in for the lost local data. Since our story, the Bureau says it has committed to developing methodology for state estimates, but cautions those are still under evaluation. And the FBI has said that assaults on police are not captured in any estimates it's currently preparing. Many still worry that with crime on the rise in much of the U.S., more complete and community-by-community information is needed now to find solutions. There's so much taking place right now and so much uncertainty in this country. Uh, We can't lose these vital stats. Mark Greenblatt, Newsy, outside Washington, D.C. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. It's a good place to reach me seeing that my weekly screen time report rudely alerted me that I'm spending almost two hours a day on Twitter. Simulations can do a lot to help replicate real life experiences. Simulations can also shield us from the real world, but we'll save the Matrix references for another show. One simulation program to help train nurses is gaining popularity. Now, it doesn't have PS5 level graphics, but this tech uses virtual patients to help bring nursing students into the workforce. National reporter Stephanie Stone explains. I feel better now. I can definitely breathe better, but my chest is kind of sore. From pediatrics. I'm actually really tired, sleepy, a little dizzy too, and there's some pain in my abdomen. To maternal health, you're looking at the future of nursing school, and it's happening now. The the technology is so good, it's, you'll get an answer. You might not get the answer that you are looking for, so you may have to rephrase. And that's the way it is in real life too. Lori Rilko is an assistant professor at George Washington University School of Nursing. She was a nurse practitioner for 30 years and then decided it was time to help the next generation of nurses. My greatest responsibility is to prepare future nurse practitioners um, in the art of accurate history taking and um, skilled physical exam and then putting all the pieces of the puzzle together to come up with a a clinical diagnosis. She says George Washington was already using this simulated technology when the pandemic hit. It put them in the perfect position to continue training new medical professionals, and it allows them to learn, practice, and fail on computers rather than on real life patients. It's kind of like um, telehealth. We've had telehealth, and until we had to really rely on telehealth, There were a lot of barriers to overcome. One of the challenges in higher education institutions, uh, specifically in the United States, and I think this is true worldwide, um, is that they have challenges meeting the demand. So they have capacity constraints. 
One example of that is shortages of clinical space. Digital simulations um, help solve that problem. Brent Gordon is the managing director for Elsevier's nursing and health education business, which recently acquired Shadow Health. He says one of the real problems that the virtual education solves is that of communication, which he says can be at the root of medical malpractice claims. Nurses are increasingly graduating, passing the NCLEX, but not entering practice with the clinical reasoning skills that they need to be successful on day one. Lori says her students enjoy the virtual interaction and they enjoy doing their training on their own time. Some are currently working on the front lines and taking the courses in their spare time. Everyone is really nice here. Thank you very, very, very much. And it seems the virtual patients like it too. I'm Stephanie Stone reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow for more In The Loop, same time, same place. Top stories from news you're headed your way right now.